Hey yeah, folks, this is Shantron here, and today we're going to be taking a look at an early game build. I've been looking around on the interwebs, and it seems that a lot of people are mostly having trouble with the very first part of the game. Level 3 to 4 specifically, before you hit that power bump at level 5, can offer some uh, hard fights for a lot of people out there. So, I'm going to be taking a look at a build for that specific level frame, level 3 to 4. This one I have been using as a solo build, and so far I've been able to go through the game without taking a single point of damage. Okay, so let's get into what the power of this build is. Fate hey with us, man. It's been a while. Good to see you. We start out with a single level of Druid. We're picking up Resistance and Guidance. Guidance because it's amazing, and Resistance because it's quite okay for certain... Um, uh, certain conversations. You could take Thorn Whip here instead if you prefer a little more tactical availability in combat. That could be a thing. For my abilities, Strength 8 because Strength doesn't matter. Dexterity 16 because Dexterity is our primary ability score. It's the one we're going to be basing our attacks off and therefore we want it to be as high as possible. Constitution 12 just because that's what we have left of points once we've placed whatever else we need. Intelligence 8 doesn't matter. We can uh, grab the headband in case we want to do any of the uh, of the skill checks at certain points, we can just equip that. For our Wisdom and Charisma, you can either go 14 Wisdom, as you can see I have here, and 16 Charisma, or you can reverse it as you please. Your Spell DC saves is mostly going to, going to be uh, based off of Wisdom, so you could up that, but I prefer having a little more for my Persuasion and um, Intimidation, those skills. As you can see, I have a, a Drow here. I take Drow because I want to have access to hand crossbows as soon as possible. Since we're also taking a level of fighter here, it doesn't matter too much. You can just swap that in whenever you have access to the hand crossbows to, to get that proficiency. So the Drow part doesn't matter. I'm also the Haunted One, the Dark Urge. So that sort of dictates my skills here. I would suggest taking something else to get access to better skills, especially if you're doing a solo because that's not amazing. But you do you, of course. Grab whichever skills you want, I won't go too much into that, and then head on to level 2. For level 2, we are taking the second level of Druid. This is to get access to Circle of the Spores, which is an, in my opinion, very underrated, especially early game um, build choice, whatever you want to call it. You get access to Symbiotic Entity, and let's just read this one out loud. Gain 8 temporary hit points and deal an additional 1-6 to six necrotic damage while you have them. This works for all weapon attacks. It doesn't say so, but it's only weapon attacks, unfortunately. It doesn't add on to Eldritch Blast. That would have been nice for this kind of build. Um, but it works with any sort of weapon, and since we are going to be going dual hands crossbows, this means we get this on our bonus actions as well. It also allows us to cast Halo of Spores with double damage. The Halo of Spores is this ability, which is a reaction ability. It means that you use your reaction to do something on your turn, which is a it unlocks the reaction as um, as a resource for you to use, and that is insanely powerful. So taking two levels in Sports Read here is going to give us some very nice um, available actions in combat, and it's going to up our damage on all of our attacks by 1 to 6 necrotic damage, just an extra D6 on top of it, and it stacks with everything else. Hex, whatever you want to throw in there, uh, dipping your weapons, you name it. For our spells, Druid get a couple of nice ritual spells, like... Enhanced Leap, this spell is insanely amazing. Once again, action economy, if you can turn your bonus action into a lot more movement, that might be a nice thing in certain situations. I'm also picking up Speak With Animals, because I like to be able to do that. You can just get it from potions instead, if you prefer something else. It doesn't matter, you can always uh, swap around out in the open world as well. Uh, Ice Knife, I don't really care about. Thunder Wave, I take, and then I take Fairy Fire. I might change out Fairy Fire once I hit level 3, because Drow get Fairy Fire anyway. But Thunder Wave, I definitely want to have available. The push effect on it is amazing when you don't have a high strength and you don't have this build. So, two levels of Spore Druid, specifically for these abilities here. Uh, symbiotic Entity and Halo of Spores. It's important to note with Symbiotic Entity, it only works as long as you have your temporary hit points. But you can just recast it if it falls off. Also, you should not be losing your temporary hit points. There's no reason for you to do that. You're not a melee build. And if you have Warding Bond on, it's basically 16 hit points that they need to do in one fell swoop. I'll get into how we keep replenishing those later, because that is what the build is all about. Yeah. For level 3, we are not going with another level of Druid. We are taking a single level of Fighter. This is to get Archery. This is simply too powerful to miss. Um, I've been playing so far without this. That was because I thought there was a sweet interaction with some Warlock level 
few shenanigans. But unfortunately, it doesn't work exactly how I wanted it to work. It uh, sort of works, and I'll talk about it in a second, but not exactly. So I would suggest you do this instead. Take the one level of fighter, get archery for another plus two to your ranged weapon attacks, and just enjoy that extra plus 10% hit chance. It's it's quite strong. It also means you don't have to play a draw if you don't want to. You can take a, a better race, because you should get to load three quite early on. Good. We are accepting here. And that's basically your th level 3 build. Before we go and take our 4th level, I'm just going to take a look at this. You should apply your Symbiotic Entity. This will give you 8 temporary hit points. If you have Warding Bond on, this means that you have 16 hit points of damage that you can take before this even falls off. So as long as you only take 14-15 hit points in one fell swoop, you can just replenish this. The way you're going to be replenishing it is by using an Elixir of Bloodlust and getting a lot of kills. Every time you kill something, you get 5 temporary hit points. And since Warding Burn uh, halves the damage you take, that's basically 10 hit point damage you can uh, you can get from every kill. You can see I have some other stuff on, it's not as important at the moment. Our attacks now all give plus 1d6 extra necrotic damage. I would suggest always dipping your weapons in the early game. And once you get access to it, you should be equipping Brute Mother's Revenge for the extra 1 to 6 poison damage. For the fourth level, we do have a couple of options. First of all, and most simple, you could just take another level of Druid. This would give you access to level 2 spells like Spike Growth, Enhance Ability, and a lot of other strong ones. Alternatively, you could take a level of Rogue to get access to some better skills. This would uh, help you show off some, some very much needed abilities if you're going solo, like Persuasion and Sleight of Hands. You also get access to Sneak Attack which is once per round if you are using a summon to activate it, like Shovel, for instance. And the third option is taking a single level of Light Cleric. This gives you Warding Flare. Shield yourself with Divine Light. Use your action to impose disadvantage on an attacker. The important part of this is how it's implemented. It only triggers if you were getting hit. So you can um, you can use this when in the situation where it actually counts. Unfortunately, this is your reaction, which you already have a use for in the um, sport druid ability so it's not as strong on this one as it is on a lot of other classes instead of that you could look at the most interesting i think is warlock it's probably not the strongest but it's very interesting in that it allows you to pick up minor illusion which is very great for setting up fights you can bunch up people get them into the position you want them to be all that stuff and i'd pick up friends as well for social situations a subclass, I was rolling with the Fiend, because of this one, Dark One's Blessing, getting extra temporary hit points, but unfortunately it doesn't stack with the ones you get from Bloodlust, in that you only get the 5 from Bloodlust when you make a kill, and not these on top of it. So that doesn't uh, work too well. I also had a single extra level, so I was going level 2 Druid, level 2 uh, Fiend Warlock, and that gave me the ability to cast Fiend's Vigor for 7 temporary hit points on command. Unfortunately, once you've done that, you no longer get the temporary hit points from Bloodlust, so it sort of broke the, the main interaction of the builds, and I would not suggest you do that. That's why we've incorporated the level 1 fighter instead to Archery. Instead, go for Great Old One, so you have a chance of getting um, Frightened debuff onto a lot of mobs on a critical hit, if you've set them up with Mana Illusion first, that's even more important. And for spells, whoop whoop, you should take Expeditious Retreat and Hex. Hex is amazing in honor mode, in that it allows you an extra source of non-physical damage against the legendary bosses like the owlbear and the spider that can grant themselves resistant to physical damage once they go into enrage so it, it's good for those sorts of situations also just great in general against anything that has a lot of hit points expeditious retreat is another strong one in that it allows you to both use a dash as a bonus action basically and it could allow you to activate certain on dash abilities on a bonus action instead of a, of a real action. So that's another good one to pick up here. Yeah. So basically, uh, I'd say Warlock is probably the, the strongest single level dip you could take here, but it's it's debatable. You could take any of the ones I've chosen and you would still be doing very great. If you're setting it up from the beginning, you could start with your level of Warlock instead of starting with the other ones. Since you're picking up Fighter, you should still be getting Medium Armor, Shields and Crossbows and all that goodness. And it would allow you to have a slightly better skill selection than... Um, than you do if you start through it. But that's for respec at least. Good, so that is really the gist of the build. We now have a lot of options available to us in combat. 
we have our usual attacks that are buffed by our symbiotic entity, as I mentioned before. And then we have the Halo of Spores. I mentioned it was very powerful in that it weaponized your reaction. I did not say a lot about why. Dealing 2d4 points of damage, this deals double damage as long as you are wearing symbiotic entity temporary hit points, and you should be. So 2d4 points of damage to an enemy is already great, great without using either your bonus or your main action. So that's nice, but it also can be used to do environmental stuff. So you could like use it to break ladders, or uh, maybe to to break spider webs to make stuff fall. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you can supply your own breakable stuff. In this case, we could take like a potion of healing, place it on the ground next to us, use the halo of spores to break it, and now we trigger all of our on heal effects in this case it's going to be the whispering promise ring here when you heal a creature it gains a plus one d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws for two turns this is just a permanent bless effect for us as long as we can spend our reaction on it once in a while root mother's revenge as well whenever the wearer is healed their weapon becomes coated in magic and deals an additional one to six poison damage so this is a stronger version of dipping your weapon in fire it's also better than most of the poisons because the poisons have saves and this doesn't it's just extra poison damage so it's a very strong effect you don't have to use your bonus actions to dip you can just use your reaction to both bless yourself and apply that do that every other turn and then you still have this for half of your turns to do other stuff with you can also use it to destroy any other destroyable item like a bottle of grease to apply a grease effect to a surface like an alchemist fire to set stuff ablaze a potion of speed to apply a speed effect to yourself or your party you could uh, use it on some of the bulbs, the illithid bulbs you find in the early game. Maybe a void bulb to pull in stuff. Maybe activate um, a bleed bulb to give people disadvantage on constitution saves. There's a lot of very, very strong uses for, for this halo of spores. For items, I've already talked about my necklace and one of my rings. The other items I'd like to talk about is another ring, the ring of protection here. Armor class plus one, saving throws plus one. This is a great item. You should probably switch it out with Kala's Ring once you get access to that. I'm using whatever shield I have. I'm using whatever hand crossbows I can find. I'm using whichever melee weapon you can find. Once you go down into the Underdark, you should easily be able to pick up Fala Aloof, which would be a huge upgrade for the Shriek action. I'm using the Gloves of Archery for extra plus two damage on each of my attacks. That's awesome. Whichever armor is the best that I can find. Medium, of course. Or headpiece at the moment it's the haste helm but you can find better later into the game you should have the headband of arcane uh, intellect to swap on in in case you want to do an intellect check of some sort and i don't at the moment because i still have the ogres in waiting for a fight down the line but keep that in mind and then of course for boots you have a couple of uh, options but i'd suggest you go with the speedy light feet when the wearer dashes it takes a similar action to in combat they gain three lightning charges lightning charges are amazing plus one to attack plus one to damage other items that are worth mentioning shape shifter spoon ring is astonishing it's a really really strong one. put it on shape shift into something uh, either by casting this guy's self if you have it or using this helmet if you have that one. so i'm just going to be changing into a male drow here at this point, you can see I have Mark of the Shifter for another plus 1d4 bonus on all checks. This is all uh, ability checks and skill checks and stuff like that, not actual saves and attacks. But at this point, I can just swap it back out, take the Whispering Promise Ring on, and as long as I stay shape shifted, I'll keep this effect. So keep that in mind. I have Shovel, as you can see. You can pause it. This would be if you were a rogue to activate your sneak attack other than that he's also just great at setting up surprises and scouting out places due to his natural invisibility lastly let me talk about the illithid pass that i think that you should take i think you should go for favorable beginnings as your first the first attack roll or ability check you make against any target gains a bonus equal to your proficiency bonus this is amazing on any character that makes any sort of attack rolls in combat or even does ability checks in uh, in conversations just get it it's great Sionic Overload, I mostly take this to get to Ability Drain, but it's also great on its own. Another 1d4 Psychic Damage on top of all of the rest of the damage you deal for each of your attacks, it's great. The Psychic Damage that it deals to you can probably be handled by your shield, so it should be okay. It lasts 10 turns, so it works once per short rest, so it should be available for, for when you need it. And then the Ability Drain, once per turn, when you make an attack roll, the attack reduces that target's corresponding ability by 1. 
Corresponding means that since you're attacking with dexterity-based attack, it's going to be that dexterity that it lowers. And dexterity determines armor class. So once in a while, this means that you get like 5% extra chance to hit on something. If you want to play around it, you can use your first attack in a round to attack something with a lot of hit points that you suspect will be alive for a couple of turns after this. And it might even lower that armor class in round one already. So this is probably what I'd take at this point in the game. So that should be it for the build. I hope you've enjoyed the video and might want to try out this build sometime in the future, maybe. And then all that's left to do is say thank you for joining, if you have been. I've been Shantan, and you've most definitely been awesome. Don't forget to do the YouTube stuff, and bye-bye. <laughs>